Hey, it's Aaron the Metal Theologian. It's kind of been a while, too, because, uh, well, it just has fucking that time of year, right? Spencer was in town hanging out for a couple weeks, and, uh, and I was kind of on a lot of streams, actually. December was kind of a busy month for me, but, uh, just not on my own channel. Because, you know, when I do something like that on one day, then, like, it's sort of like I do it in the, it's, sort of, it's something I just do in the evening is maybe I'll make a video. So if I do a stream somewhere, I feel like I've done it. You know what I mean? So it's like, shit, what the hell am I going to talk about? It's just something like stream, you know? And I know that nobody watches old shit. Like I could go and I always worry about new topics. I could go like take topics that I had, you know, shit six months ago, let alone like six years ago, you know, and just rehash that shit, you know? No one ever be the wiser, but uh, I don't know. You know, there's still this, like, expectation in my head, right? Since I know what I'm doing here and here and, like, in all these different places, of course, everyone else does too, right? You know? So, yeah, the psychology of, like, being just a normal guy who does YouTube shit, I guess, as opposed to, like, someone who actually, like, has a schedule or, you know, is responsible about it anyway. Yeah, anyhow, so most of this sort of like little what's spinning video, but, um, you know, by way of a little bit of topic, there are a couple things that sort of came up after one of the last streams, so, uh, I'll sort of bring some of that shit up as I go, I think, but, um, right now, I feel like I've been hyping this record a lot lately, but I've just been so into it. This is the Commander record. I was pulling some shit out to fucking talk about for, like, the topic for the video, and I, I sort of, I was over by the stacks, and I was like, God damn it, I have fucking Knights of the Round Table in my head again, you know? Or like Return of the Goths, I get that one in there all the time. We're Ready is a great one. Fucking every song on this record is so good, dude. I, God, I really hope that record gets easier to find one of these days because I realize what I'm putting out there. Here's another one I just want to sort of been working on getting my head around a little bit. This is Black Obelisk. Look at these guys. It's funny, the picture looks so like 1990, like early 90s. It looks like sort of the transition to like, from like, you know, like the metal, like the pure metal shit into more like the cult kind of look. You know what I mean? That's sort of, but this record, if anything, has sort of a punky edge to it that's kind of uh, weird. You know, it's uh, it's not really normal sounding a uh, metal band. You know, if I can be able to throw it on for the because what the hell, I'm sitting here trying to describe it. And Commander is great. I mean, this is one of my favorite records. Okay? Like, no qualifiers on that. Just one of my favorite records. But, it's still just a really good metal record. You know what I mean? It's a perfect metal record, I think. It's executed in so many ways. And, like, of all the sort of subgenres of metal, this is kind of my favorite kind, you know? So it's a great record to me. But it's still just a metal record. This other one over here, I mean, it's not not just a metal record, right? Oh, by the way, in case you're worried about the ocean, that's called a, a Chornley Obelisk. I think that's how you'd say it in Cyrillic. I don't fucking know. Or in Russian, I guess it would be. All right, here we go. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a metal record. Like, this mostly sounds like a metal record, but sometimes they make these little, like, songwriting decisions that just sound kind of weird. And, like, the things that in my head are sort of um, labeled as, like, punk devices. But if I just say, this is a metal record that sounds kind of punk, that that doesn't at all tell you what I'm thinking. That's, like, I mean, seriously, because in my head, I think DRI. And, like, or, or, you know, something like that. Or fucking, you know, Cryptic Slaughter. I mean, to me, I guess DRI is more of a punk band that sounds metal than a metal band that sounds punk. But whatever. The point is, it evokes that sort of thing. And that's not what these guys sound like. For one thing, when they do the metal, it's more pure. For another thing, one of the things that throws me a little bit is that it sounds modern, like 19, early 90s modern in a way that I wouldn't expect from a Russian record from, it was like 90 or 91. You know what I mean? I'd probably expect it to be a little bit backwards. It took a little time for the shit to get over there. They couldn't make records like this that easily anyway when, you know, shit was bad politically. And these guys don't sound like that. So that singer's kind of punky, you know? Almost more like boy, you know? Yeah, 
Yeah, we'll see if something comes through if there's a good example. But uh, I think that's a little bit better description. It's just surprising in little places in ways that I don't necessarily always even like, but they're always interesting. You know, and that's kind of what I'm digging about this record. As far as Russian records, they're just fun to listen to. I was playing this one all last week, man. <laughs> EVM. <laughs> Group. Grupa. EVM. I don't know. Yeah, it's Throbs Boy to a Dome. I love this fucking record, dude. It's really stupid. I mean, this is really kind of a brain dead record in a lot of ways, you know? But it's punchy. It's brain dead exactly the way you want metal to be. And there are some kind of slow jams on here, and they kind of lose the plot a little bit in places on this record, okay? It's a little bit of a mess of a record as far as focus, okay? But when these guys are on, they're just so fucking on, dude. And they're just like, you just want to walk up and shake their hand, you know? It's kind of one of those types of bands. They just fucking rule. This is the sort of band... <coughs> Where, like, you see them, they're, like, opening for a band you give a shit about. And, like, you see these guys and you go, you know, I may never hear them again, but they're so cool. I'm going to buy a fucking t-shirt just because support them. You know what I mean? Just because, you know, it's the Christian thing to do. <laughs> so, yeah, EVM. Yeah, here's actually another one I come playing a lot, dude. You know, I kind of love Graham Bonnet. You know what's funny? Fucking Graham Bonnet. Looking awkward as fuck in a leather jacket instead of his fucking, like, his blazer that he usually wears. Or at least was fond of wearing, apparently, around this time. I don't know, but 82, maybe he'd give it up. But I don't know, you know, I don't exactly consider myself a big MSG fan. And I'm generally kind of hostile to bands that are just named for one of the guys. And I'm even more hostile when they name the band for one of the guys, so you're already at a shitty starting point, and then they try and, like, make it a little bit hipper by doing something like this, by calling it MSG, like, that's clever. I mean, and these guys really were the kings of that, since they made two couple Michael Shanker records, and they changed it to McGauley Shanker when they had to appease some other bozo's ego to get him to come sing for the band, right? Like, the MSG, like, that was such a good fucking band name, they just had to, like, rejigger, like, the words underneath it to make sure that it still worked out to MSG. Fucking, there's some bullshit going on there, man. Like, that is not, like, that's the kind of shit where, um, well, anyway. I, I still really like this record, though, man. I think I paid a buck for this thing. And, you know, it's, um, it's almost as good as the first Alcatraz record, which I also really like, you know? And if you want to shit on these records, there are lots of good reasons to do it. But if you can just sort of let your guard down and take it in, man, it's a lot of fun. This thing's kind of corporate, sunny, and kind of slick, but it's not so slick and corporate that you can't sit down and enjoy the tunes, you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, again, the touch point is, like, out the Alcatraz, it's not like, you know, it's not, it doesn't sound like Van Halen 1984 or something like that. I mean, it's not that sort of defanged. So, when, um, I heard that stream with, uh, about the Jesus Metal a few weeks ago over on the Heavy Metallurgy stream, like, after we finished up, we talked for a little while. And there were a couple sort of sacred cows that came up. Or not so much sacred cows, as much as things that people say about music and about bands that I like. And um, so I was sort of like, thinking, well, maybe I want to reconsider some of these. I'm not so sure if they're true. And the first one that came up was um, Alan said something about. Actually, I think Alan said both these things, but this isn't like a shit on Alan video. I mean, on the content, is like Alan knows his shit, so we're having this kind of a conversation with you, right? So Alan said something about how. Um, Christian bands tend to be better when their focus is more on the music than, like, just on the preaching, right? And that's, like, kind of a truism, right? Like, I mean, it's sort of one of those sorts of things. Like, Striper, what was their biggest problem? Is they were always too cheap, too preachy, right? I mean, I'll tell you, I think Striper sucks, okay? And I'm, like, this whole, like, sort of vinyl community revisionism where, like, somehow retrospectively you pretend Striper was cool. I'm not on board. Now, obviously, I'm exaggerating a little bit to be funny if you actually like Striper. 
That's fine. You know, and if I were in your house and you put on a Striper record, it's not going to melt. You know? Whether or not I like something isn't necessarily the only determining factor going into whether or not I'll enjoy it. And I, actually, I just realized we're going like this. That's not what I mean. I just mean like, uh, you know, right mood, hanging out. Anyway, so that's sort of the truism, right, with the, with the Christian bands, but I started thinking about it, and I was like, you know something? I don't know that these records really get a whole lot preachier than this. Holy Right is preachier than this, because Holy Right is really like a fucking sermon with some songs around it almost. I mean, it's not. It's all songs, but it's almost like that direct. But this record is really direct. This record is so... Okay, the song titles... Baptized in Blood, Are You Ready? Okay, No Time to Die, then Soldier of Compromise is about, like, not being serious enough, right? You're compromising with the world. Like, you say you're a Christian, but you're not really serious enough, right? Thrown in the fire is your little threat one, right? And don't run away. And uh, then there's even, like, an anti-porn song, then Rated X. Or about like how society's decayed and shit, but like rated X. So this is a really heavy-handed record. This is one of my favorite Jesus records. This record fucking smokes. Every song on it is great. It just rocks, man. I mean, it's a record that's, that rocks like that Commander record. It's also a record, just in case, you know, you're like getting ready to go and like do one of these. This is a record I had to have for a while to sort of prove myself worthy of. It was one I sort of revisited every so often, and then one day I was like, Jesus Christ, this is the fucking greatest thing ever. I think Blind Faith might have been the song that really won me over while I was like, wait, I want to hear that again now, you know? It might have been. It might have been Don't Run Away either, too, because that's actually one of the cornier songs on here, but it's the second last song that wraps it up so well. Anyway, this is an absolutely fantastic record. And then this is another one that I raved about a lot. And this is not a subtle record, man. Fucking Messiah, Final Warning. Who's to Blame, Out of Control, Where Are You, The Choice, Heavenly Metal, Final Warning. You know, you know it's not like the song titles are our, like, Convert Now or Satan Will Rip You Apart, you know? And then the next song title is... You know, Satan's heating up poker if you don't confess right now. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not like, you know, yeah, you could imagine a more extreme record than this. But this is really pretty direct. This is not a subtle record in any way. And I fucking love it, dude. Every song, this is one of those records where I pull it out to play it once, I end up playing it every day for the next week. Like, every time I pull this thing out, just about. It's a fucking total favorite record. If I want to go... Well, the preachier bands are the uh, tend to suck because they, uh, you know, because they're not focused as much on the music. They're more focused on the preaching. I don't know, man. I feel like I have two really strong counterexamples right here. Now, I haven't gone through all my Jesus records, and you know, if you've been watching for a while, you know that I have more than two. Um, yeah, I I'm just not really sure that that's true. That's all. So that's that's sort of this little. A little sort of, uh, I guess a sacred cow you could call it, that I'm gonna kind of, you know, maybe take the dagger to a little bit here. The other thing is that, uh, this is a little more specific. <clears throat> it's a little more specific, but a little more general at the same time. It's more specific because we were talking about specifically in the context of new wave British heavy metal. And if you want to go to like, 50s rock and roll, not 50s, 60s rock and roll or something like that, you might well be able to make a much better argument than what I'm going to present here in this specific context, okay? So in that sense, it's narrower, but in the, it's broader in the sense that the, the truism is that bands, I, I bust out my 45s here to sort of make a point, that, that bands like, you know, why, why did this band or that band only make 145? Well, Actually, here's a counterexample right here. Okay, so Battleaxe. So why did Battleaxe make this 45? Presumably so they could shop it around, hopefully get some attention and get a deal with a label. Okay, so that's why these bands are making 45s. All right. Well, this is my box. Oh, shit. 
this, this is my new wave of British heavy metal 45s. Okay, that's about how much I've got. Like, there might be two or something. No, actually, I think this is all new wave shit now. Yeah. How many of those bands got deals? Okay, Battle Axe. It's funny that I happen to reach for this one because it's on Guardian. Guardian was a label, but Guardian was like really a fly-by-night operation. So I suppose you could argue that Guard the Guardian did get their deal with I don't even know who it was with. Was it Music for Nations? I'm pretty sure mine was on Music for Nations, but uh, both of my Battle Axe records. But those might have been licensed deals or something. So maybe they put out this 45 and that yielded deal that led to those two LPs. Okay. But I have all of these other fucking records, and how many more examples can I pull out? Now, maybe that just means it's hard. But were all these guys just that fucking naive, too? You know, maybe people didn't put out 45s in the hope of getting a deal, you know what I mean? I, I don't feel like even phrasing this right, but... I really wonder if that's true, is what I'm saying. I'm just starting to wonder if this had a lot more to do with just sort of networking, and the fact that it's cool to have a record that you made yourself with your band on it. And you know, you could sell them to fans at shows and trade them with people and shit like that. Because, I mean, even the ones where I look and go, okay, this, there, here's the first single that, you know, and they had some LPs. Okay, so Demon, right? But this is on Clay. And the albums were on Carrere, the French label, right? But, I don't know. Diamond Head is another example I could throw out there. And then the big one's obviously Def Leppard, okay? I suppose you could say Iron Maiden, too, okay? But even then... Well, Iron Maiden, I, I don't... The Soundhouse tapes, okay? So there was one indie. See, I'm thinking this through as I go along. You can tell the video is, like, authentic here. I think I see where I'm going with this. I, I'm, I'm really starting to challenge in my head the whole concept of purpose of putting out a 45 as being to secure a deal in one way or another, you know? I mean, obviously times have changed so much now anyway that this really kind of an irrelevant proposition. And I think that what I'm, what I'm saying about then is almost definitely true now, that it's just for the few people who want it and it's just because it's cool, you know? Because who the fuck wants a, you know, who wants a downloads and you can't have this, you know? It's cool, you know? Well, let's be honest. That's why you're watching. So yeah, there we go. You know, a lot of the examples that we came up though when we were talking were like, um, you know, bands that maybe got a record out on Meat or something like that. You know, like Jaguar had um, the Backstreet Woman single on um, Heavy Metal, and then they got an LP on Neat. And Bitches Sin actually did the opposite. They had a 45 on Neat that led to an LP on heavy metal um but you know if you're going from one label with a roster of three or four bands to another is that really is that really that like, you've got a win out of your 45 you know i mean in a sense you did in the sense that you didn't get a loss but you know is the cause and effect relationship really what we're pretending it is Especially because I love to imagine an A&R guy <laughs> looking at one of these goofy heavy metal covers <coughs> with the Japanese on it as if it was, uh, I was a fake Japanese, but... Yeah, but as far as I can tell, the con, con is correct. Probably says more about my ignorance than about uh, the record or the good folks at Heavy Metal Records. Oh yeah, here's another one I was thinking of as an example. I mean, these guys got about as big a single release as you could, Weapon. Right? Because this thing had a picture sleeve, it came out on a 7-inch and on a 12-inch, which is the one I happened to secure of myself years ago. Nothing. If you've heard of these guys, it's probably from that comp that Lars put out. Lars Ulrich, the New York British Heavy Metal 79, Revisited, whatever it's called. You know? It's a really cool record, you know? But it didn't get him anywhere. That Parallax record didn't get anybody anywhere. That was another 12 inch. Hollow Ground didn't go anywhere. Most bands don't go anywhere. So maybe it's just that, you know? Maybe that is still the dream, and they're just. 
way more artifacts of this shit than ever. But I almost kind of wonder if that's the sort of thing that people did in the 60s. You know what I mean? The sort of thing that, like, Elvis did, right? When he, like, went and cut that record for his mother, supposedly that some A&R person heard, or whatever the story was about that. You know what I mean? You might get a 45, or, you know, a label would, like, cut a 45 to try it out, and that sort of thing. But I think by the 80s... I strongly suspect the dynamics have changed somewhat, but I don't know. I don't fucking know anything, right? Let's see if any of the records to show here. This is a cool one. I'm kind of lukewarm on some of the Spanish ones sometimes, but this is a relatively recent one that I'm going to check out. And uh, it's a lot of people in the band, but they kind of deliver on looks, even though they don't have mustaches, <laughs> especially this guy. He's my favorite. This is the guy who beats you up if you say they suck. Like, if you start booing or something, he comes down off the stage and finds you. And it's not hard because there aren't that many people in the audience. This record's great. There's some Spanish records that I think are kind of lame, like Obus and Panzer, or Panzer I didn't think was that great. I want to say Panzer because I assume they're German in my head, right? But they're Spanish, so what's Panzer? I don't fucking know. I like Baron Rojo. This is probably more like Exodo as far as the, uh... I think grandiosity is maybe too strong a word for it, but it definitely has, um, some aspirations. This is the sort of thing I was talking about, by the way. It feels like a punk song that's played like a metal band is playing it, you know what I mean? But they borrowed the punk singer. But it still only sounds about... 70 to 80 percent as punk as you would expect it to sound based on how I just described it. It sounds a lot more metal than that. You know what I mean? That's Black Oboist. This is what I was talking about earlier if you're still listening. So I'm going to flip it out and put on Gol Goliath for a minute and then we'll probably wrap it up. I love these fucking labels. You're such a sucker for that shit. Look at that. Yeah. I mean, I don't only gobble up the fucking... Russian records. They're a pain in the ass to collect if you don't have a fucking Cyrillic keyboard. And believe me, I know I read these fucking titles on here and shit, but it's not like my fucking spelling for these words is anything when I'm trying to detect that shit out. So, there are a few, like, sort of secret tricks that I've worked out for finding some of this shit, but, uh, sometimes there are just sort of certain linguistic limitations. Although, I might have told the story before. One of my favorite little ones like that was, um, that pig record that I've showed like a hundred times, the Japanese one where you press the nose and it squeaks. Um, when I messaged the guy, I saw it on a list and it was like a lot cheaper than I'd been seeing the thing going for. So I kind of freaked out. And I messaged the dude in Japan like saying, hey, do you still have that? You know, is it available? I don't care what it costs to ship it. This is long enough ago that you can still ship for it. Japan might have been 20 bucks at the time, but it wasn't even that bad. He said something like, yes, but the pig's nose don't cry. I thought that was such an awesome way of putting it, you know? That's why non-native English speakers write great lyrics, I think. Because that's the sort of thing where... You, you might be able to imitate that one, but there are certain terms of phrase that come about that are just... Uh, come about, I think, from translating idioms directly and those sorts of things. You just can't anticipate that as a native speaker. Even, I mean, I've studied a few different languages, okay? I mean, obviously English, I'm pretty comfortable with German, but, like, I've studied, like, three or four others, so I understand how languages work reasonably well and shit. And those sorts of things are just always amusing. And, like, as a native speaker, you're perfectly positioned to enjoy when a foreigner says something like that, or when a foreigner, like, comes up with a turn of phrase like that, but you're never going to be able to reproduce it, man. And, like, that sort of shit... That's the difference between, like, lyrics that are good and lyrics that are magical, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, yeah. So, let's hear it for non-native English speakers. This rocks, doesn't it? This isn't a wussy Obus record, you know? And this is Spanish, too, by the way, so, you know? Sometimes these guys can smoke without singing, even if without delivering on the funny English lyrics, right? The French bands always sing in French, too. God, this fucking guy. Like, their names are probably on the inner sleeve, but I'm not gonna look because if this guy isn't the singer, I don't wanna know. 
Don't ask questions you don't know the answers to, right? <laughs> Thanks for watching. That's my words of wisdom for tonight. Don't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to.